Welcome to the Property Management Brainstorm Show with Bob Preston. Bob is the president, owner, and broker of North County Property Group, the fastest growing and top ranked property management company in North County, San Diego. This podcast is for property owners and investors who are considering hiring a professional property management company to manage their property assets. You'll hear from leading professionals on the best practices surrounding the San Diego rental market, what's involved in successfully renting your property, and how to make sure your property is managed correctly. Now, here is your host, Bob Preston. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Property Management Brainstorm podcast. I'm Bob Preston, your host of the show, broadcasting from our studio at North County Property Group in Del Mar, California. And today we are going to talk landlord law, a hugely important topic when considering renting your property. And I have with me today, Ted Smith, the principal at Ted Smith Law here in San Diego. And Ted has built a practice representing landlords and other real estate professionals in various processes of rental properties. And thank you for joining us, Ted. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. And thanks for the opportunity, Bob. You bet. Well, Ted, maybe we can start by you telling us briefly about yourself and your business. Well, I started out 30 years ago and built an idea of handling unlawful detainers for landlords as a specialty. At that point in time in San Diego County, there were no lawyers that specialized in just one thing, the unique representation of landlords in the eviction process, no tenants. And so we developed a program and a matter of customer service in the unlawful detainer area. And general landlord tenant law lasted the test of time. And so here we are 30 years later, and I'm enjoying what I do. Interesting. So, how did you pick landlord law? I mean, what was it about that area of law that attracted you? I have a property management background. My aunt, my mom owned rental properties back in the old days in San Diego County. Uh, also, I was in the real estate business during law school, and me and my partner at the time realized that our property management clients weren't going to an unlawful detainer specialist in those days. And so I had no mentor, but I came up with the idea of doing just that one thing, reasonably priced on a volume basis, and you can make a living doing just unlawful detainers. And so it worked out. Okay. So if there are prospective landlords out there that would like to get a hold of you after the podcast, what's the best way to reach you? Well, thank you. My phone number is 619-542-7728. And my email address is evict at tedsmith.com law.info. That's E-D-I-C-T at T-E-D-S-M-I-T-H-L-E-W dot info. Perfect. And then, of course, people can contact us and we can refer them over to you if if that's okay. Okay, so let's dive right into the subject matter here and talk legal aspects of being a landlord. And if we wanted to, (laughs) this podcast could be a full semester course, or we could be talking hours on each individual topic. So this is sort of a broad brush approach to this. And, you know, we want to make that clear before diving into the topic. But we get a lot of people coming to us saying, hey, I want to rent my property, but I've heard all the horror stories and just don't want to deal with the hassles. Uh, Does that sound kind of like a familiar topic that you get? Or maybe you get it after the fact. Right, I do. But I would tell people, and I do every day, don't let an eviction or a problem tenant destroy your investment plans in real estate. It's just a a bump in the road, and it's something to be dealt with. And by proper screening and exercising yourself and and proper restraint on who you rent to, you can avoid seeing people like me in evictions. And so it's it's just a great investment idea. And the eviction issues is just a side, side annoyance. Sure. If it happens. I mean, how frequent is it really? Do you have any stats Mm -hmm. on that? Well, we do a lot of them, of course, because we specialize in it. But I've had clients come to me that may have eight units for 50 years and they just don't have a case. And finally, they have one. So the luck finally ran out. But we don't. Most of our clients, especially in this rental market, don't have too many eviction problems every now and then. It depends on who you're into. By proper screening, which we'll get into later, you can minimize your eviction headaches. Okay, and do you find that do-it-yourself landlords, like individual property man or property owners who are renting, do they tend to have more legal problems than say professional management companies? Yes, some are a little loose in their education of themselves, 
the forms are outdated and they don't use proper techniques and screening and then the paperwork involved in the eviction process. I mean, forms in the real estate industry, not only in sales, but in property management, change by the year. And if you want to manage your own properties, you better be up to speed on you know, the way the laws are changing and educate yourself. Otherwise, hand it over to a really good property management company like yourself, Bob. Okay, perfect. And what do you think the most common area is where landlords might have a legal problem? Probably screening. Um, well, you sound like a nice person. Uh, let's do a handshake and you're in. I've yeah. seen that. That's not the way to go. So screening is an issue. The other is not using proper rental agreements. And finally, not being vigilant over the behavior and what's going on at your rental properties. If you're going to manage it yourself, you better take an active interest. That's why it's so difficult that for owners that live in other states that don't want a management company locally to manage their properties because they assume that the tenant will behave and pay the rent on time. Sometimes that goes awry. Sure. So they're maybe too lenient with their tenant yes. in their approach. Well, let's talk about the basic premise of operating in the state of California. In what ways is being a landlord the same in every state, kind of under federal law? And in what ways might it be different in terms of fair housing laws and things like that that are specific to California? Well, I'm afraid it's all of the above. Both federal and state law apply to landlording in California. Hey, but did you know what? In Texas, I hate to tell you this, having done evictions in California for over 30 years, you can give the tenant a three-day notice to pay rent or quit and then change the locks, just like there's a storage unit. And they have to go to court to ask for a court date. Otherwise, it's a landlord state in Texas, for example. And there's other states that are more pro-landlord than California. So there is this influx of both federal and California law, especially when it comes to the fair housing aspect of it. And so you need to be compliant with both. Okay, perfect. Okay, Ted, well, this may be an obvious question, but why is it so important that a person considering renting their property be aware of landlord-tenant law in California? Well, you do need to be a little careful here. It's not just a matter of buying property and getting somebody in there to rent. You're stepping into an area that you was full of pitfalls, and you need to be careful. That's where a property manager that knows what he's doing mm -hmm. would be very helpful to you. If you want to do it yourself, you need to commit to educating yourself on all the various issues, the forms, legal procedures, fair housing claims, not just the usual suspected classes, but things like source of income and things like that. So you have to be very wary when dealing with the general public when you get into the rental property management uh, area. Of course, yeah. So as a real estate broker in the state of California, I have access to all the California Association of Realtor forms, which are very legally vetted, I understand, and by kind of both sides, right, protecting both the consumer or the, or the tenant and the landlord. And what do do-it-yourself landlords use for their rental agreements? They do a boo-boo. They go on the internet, which is generally a national form that is not California-specific. Yeah. It's trouble. It has basic terms. And by the way, let me point out, is a verbal rental agreement residential in California legal? Yes. It's just a nightmare and not recommended. You need to put stuff down in writing so everybody has a clear understanding, like any other contract. Remember, when it's verbal, your recollection is, is completely different than the tenant's. So that's why I reduce everything to writing. Now, the CAR form is excellent, par excellence. And so is the California Apartment Association. Both have good residential leases. Those farms are up to date and great. Okay, that's really, really good information. Now, there are some new laws in California that we've become aware of, and they're kind of interesting. There's this new bed bug law notification, Property 65 warnings and things like this. So what, what's your take on those new aspects? Well, you need to be careful on the bed bug issue. It used to be, I, I joke about it, that cockroaches were the major pest control issue in rental housing, but bed bugs have stepped in and told the cockroaches, move over, we'll, we'll move in now. <laughs> <laughs> so, because they're harder to get rid of, the pest control technician charges more for bed bugs, but it's the same problem. Who causes the bed bug problem? Yeah. It's not the landlord, it's the tenant. When it comes to bed bugs, they are, they're hitchhikers. They come into the property Either by suitcases. It's still pretty rare, though. Clothing, I was, I was property, but it's rare. Yeah, I was kind of surprised. 
when the state made us send these notifications. I mean, notifications to all of our tenants were due by January 1st this year, and we complied. And we had to calm a few tenants down saying, Mm -hmm. hey, this is just our responsibility as a broker, and we're passing along this information to assist the state of California with health information. I mean, generally, Mm -hmm. that's what it was all about, right? Well, that's it. Sacramento is being proactive tenant-wise. You've got to remember that if you're a politician, most of your constituency is tenants. And as a result, somebody complains to a simple about a drug problem, and then it becomes a law. So yeah. we have to react and comply and be vigilant in watching the property and make sure guess, the tenants do their part by keeping the apartment clean and bed bug free. Perfect. I guess I wanted to bring it up because there are new laws that come out periodically where the state of California expects landlords to follow certain procedures and provide certain information in their leases. So it's really important for staying up on that. And that's one thing as a property management company we kind of bring to the table as well. Right. Okay. So the first phase of any rental process is the listing, showing, taking rental applications on the property. And there's important legal considerations right away, even when showing the property and taking rental applications, correct? That's right. What, I guess, should a landlord take into account when they start meeting people, start speaking with people about their rental property? I mean, there are fair housing laws. There are certain compliance aspects that need, that need to be paid attention to. Well, the fair housing has, is a huge deal, and you need to be very careful here. Remember, fair housing laws basically, in a nutshell, require you to treat people equally, no matter who they are, where they're from. Uh, you know, the usual categories apply. But not only that, source of income, children, uh, race, color, creed, national origin, religion, all those are factors that need to be ignored in mental housing. We're a neutral provider of housing, and so everybody's okay in our book. Everybody, however, has to pay the rent on time. Everybody has to observe the rules and behave. That applies across the board to all various people. ADA compliance deals with the issue of people with disabilities. And generally speaking, for example, a person that is uh, using a wheelchair will be perhaps required to have a ramp on one entrance to their apartment if it's reasonable to install that. Those kinds of things apply to uh, disability issues. Then there's service animals. Service animals are an exception to the no pet rule. Keep in mind that in California, you still have the right to say no pets. That's the rule. However, if a person with reasonable evidence from a qualified California health practitioner would be entitled to exception to the no pet rule by providing evidence of a disability, and therefore it's a companion pet and can be allowed despite the no pet rule. As far as maximum occupancy rules, that's always a troublesome area. The California Department of of Fair Employment and Housing says, listen, we don't have a specific rule, but we're going to go by a rule of thumb. If we get called by a tenant that's angry and they have many children and so forth, we're going to take a look at this. Our standard that we use, says the California Department of Employment and Housing, is that two per bedroom plus one. Right. Two per bedroom plus one. So we go five to a two and three to a one, things like that. That third person can be anybody. So If you go below that, you are at risk. There is no statute specifically stating how many are authorized, but if you go with a two-bedroom plus one, you're in a safe haven into that area. Then we have the problem of undocumented citizens. Undocumented citizens. Undocumented citizens. Now, here is where you need to be careful. You have to be in the United States legally, and there's a number of ways to be in the United States legally and rent an apartment. Unfortunately, it's not a requirement that a person can be in the United States and have to have a social security number right away. However, we'd like to have that to run the credit because the credit reporting agency does use socials. But if you have that rule, it'll be problematic for you. What you want to do is just confirm the person is lawfully in the United States, and then you can go from there in terms of screening, credit report, rental history, and... Right. So we have some people who, for example, students who have come in on some sort of a foreign exchange or something where they're legally documented in the United States, but they don't necessarily have a social security number. And, you know, we have to screen them a different way because they might be from Asia or Europe or some other country where they're coming in to attend school or or for maybe a temporary work visa, something like that. All that's reasonable in the screening process. You know, you have to take that into consideration because they don't have rental history. And so 
that places a quite legal concern that you have over performance of the lease down the road. Good. Well, what about the tenant application process? So screening applicants, and I guess what criteria are acceptable when screening and making a tenant decision? There's three pillars to three pillars to screening, I should say, and it's like a stool, you know, with three legs. Three legged stool. Sure. Three legged stool. If you have one falls off, they're denied. What's one leg is credit report. Okay, so and the other leg is income, and the other leg is tenant kind of history, real history. And so all those combine to qualify a candidate for renting. And so as far as the credit is concerned, you establish your policy for your property. There's no rule in California that says, here's what it must be. Right. So you can do anything that's reasonable so long as it's not discriminatory. So the credit score part of that, yes, it is legal to have a FICO score minimum if you go with that, apply it across the board. Most people don't do that because they use a flexible one where income and credit and so mm-hmm. forth are uh, evaluated on an independent basis. Kind of a holistic approach it's to right. evaluating that. Uh, the, there's bankruptcy. I mean, you can use all these things as a disqualification factor, but you don't have to. You can ignore things, but you can include bankruptcy in the overall evaluation of the person's credit score because that'll be in their history. And then the income verification. The more difficult to confirm it, the more information you can require. So the self-employed people, like work for cash, that's a problem. We like pay stubs. We like, you know, something that proves the income. The difficult income to prove, of course, is we have alimony. We have child support. We have welfare. Remember, it would be a discriminatory answer to the following question over the telephone. If you accept welfare and you say something like, don't bother that's not going to work because what happens there is you have to say the politically correct answer. And that is we accept all forms of income. We will sure. take it into consideration. Come on in and fill out an application. But then it comes out that, oh, I see you are too low. And she says, it's because I'm on welfare. You say, no, it's because your income is too low. Right. You still have to qualify under yeah. our standard criteria. What about criminal history and sex, sex offenders, things like that? Well, criminal history is a problematic area. It can be used. Ordinarily, it's not uh, because the credit score should be good enough on that. If you have a policy that says for a documented serious felony, for example, that would be legal if, if you apply it across the board. Some people have gotten probation, they've made restitution, and they're good citizens now. And so they argue that it's too old and too irrelevant. So it does you know, create problems. But it's, some people go by uh, criminal background searches. As far as sex offenders, I'm afraid that there's an exception to the, the, that rule that says that you may not, in California, discriminate on a person's conviction of a sex offense. Even though he's a registered sex offender, that law specifically accepts that crime from disqualification for rental. Interesting. The categories are in housing and employment and loans, things like that. Having said that, <clears throat> by the way, he knows this. He knows where he can live. Usually he knows where he's supposed to live. If he's supposed to be too close to a daycare center, those kinds of things, the sex offender, the convict knows. He either discloses it during the application process or he doesn't. But even though he doesn't disclose it, you find out later, you know, you have to ignore it. So you do not want to tell, you do not want to secretly go on the, the website and find out that he is convicted sex offender. And then to conclude, you're going to deny him. You're going to have to find other ways to deny him. Income, rental history. That's good. What if you just get a bad feeling about somebody? Like if I meet you, maybe you start arguing with me or you start negotiating too hard or you're too aggressive or you use profanity. (laughs) Can I deny you just because I don't like you as a person? And that's just the attorneys that apply. I mean, it's crazy. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But no, you have the right to ask. A person, look, we need to deal with this in a business-like manner. You need to come back when you're calmed down so we can discuss this. If they, if you say, look, I'm not going to, if they act belligerent and rude during the screening process, you would have the right to say, you need to leave because I can't complete the process. Well, I'm going to sue you for discrimination. No, we want to go through with this, but we can't go through your type of behavior right now. So you have the right to be respected during this process. As far as the bad feeling, though, you're going to have to document your bad feeling with the, with some factual evidence that would support your denial of them to rent. 
Sure. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. What about steps surrounding approving a tenant? So if I meet you face-to-face at a rental property and I say, okay, you're in, <laughs> and I take a deposit from you, and then there's some some kind of uh, time or amount of time that might pass between accepting that deposit and getting a lease in place. Are there any things I need to be careful about or steps I need to take legally during that kind of gray area phase? There's a thing called a holding deposit or an apartment preservation agreement that states that you give us this deposit for holding it for you. You're now approved and you're expected to sign the lease and move in by such and such date, which is down the road, not too far. Maybe the next month. If they change their mind in the meantime, the deposit agreement would declare that you have the right to keep back a daily rental value up to the time they cancel the deal. However, once they sign the lease but have yet to move in, you can declare that they're in breach of the lease and discharge them for rent that is accruing in your favor after the time they wrongfully try to cancel the lease. Mm -hmm. The first comment I made was the time between their approved and the time the lease once sure. the time the lease is signed, even though it's supposed to move in a little later, that you still got them to the lease. Right. And they don't They've have the right to cancel lease at that point. With a specific start date. And by the way, there is no three day cooling off period in the state of California for residential leases. Once the lease is signed, it's it, binding. It's binding. You can't cancel it. It's not door to door sales, mortgages, things like that. That doesn't apply to residential leasing. That's a common myth. Okay, terrific. Well, We've talked a little bit about uh, the importance of the lease agreement itself. We use the state of California, California Association of Realtors lease. I'm going to skip ahead here, and let's talk uh, about security deposits. Perhaps, other than eviction, this might be the most acrimonious aspect of the job for us, because anytime we try to withhold somebody's secure, security deposit, there seems to be you know issues with that. Do you know that the most commonly filed small claims action in San Diego County is on deposits for land? Yeah, I believe far. it. Okay. You know, you know, because what's reasonable wear and tear to the tenant is to you, just like their personal property they leave behind is treasure to them, but really a junk to us. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's a personal thing for tenants. They so like let's talk thing. about normal wear and tear. This is a term that the state of California gives us. Yeah. Very subjective. What what does it mean? Can you summarize it? I mean, I've tried to summarize it. It's like defining the meaning of life. The legislature is of no help here. That civil code section in California, civil code section 1950.5 states, damages above ordinary wear and tear, reasonable cleaning, and rent defaults. Those are the three things, but they give you no guidelines, so they really don't help. Mm -hmm. So you have to use your common sense on a day-to-day basis. We know what it was like before. You have a check-in sheet that hopefully was signed. Right. We know what we have now, and we have a standard. And there's two standards, by the way. One is ordinary wear and tear. So the outgoing tenant will give them a little bit of leeway on certain deductions, maybe, because that might be ordinary wear and tear, like the carpet might be slightly dirty. Might be and then there's the rent ready standard, where the incoming person wants it perfect. Yep. That measure of work, work making it rent ready is different than ordinary wear and tear on the outgoing person. So um, there's two standards of deduction, but ordinary wear and tear is things like just that medium stuff. It does not include holes in the walls, broken right. blinds, substantial cleaning, carpet that's pets and stuff severely like that. stained, yeah, um, stained, sure. and so forth. So ordinary is just just that glaring things where they deliberately destroy stuff or they're very reckless in how they live mm-hmm. are all deductible from the deposit. The most important thing about the deposit is remembering to uh, account to them within the time period allowed by law, and that's 21 days after their departure. That needs to be mailed to the last known address with an accounting of what you've deducted, and if it's more than $125 in deduction, then you have to give them copies of all the invoice that you have from the vendors. We try to take photographic evidence as well, which is always helpful, you know, in showing people why things were deducted. And we, of course, use the move in, move out form so that we capture the property condition of move in and then again, a move out. And we have that pretty well documented. What is the useful life rule? Now, that also has to apply to security deposit deductions. It does. It's not illegal to have a, a guideline for your deductions on a deposit based on the average life of carpet, paint, and things like that. 
keep in mind those guides that you might come up as an addendum to your lease may be subject to review by the small claims court judge. He doesn't have to go by those, but if they're reasonable, they've agreed to it in writing, they're going to give this, for example, we'll give this carpet a five-year life, and then we'll prorate out the replacement costs based on that. That's on the face of it legal. So stay with that until you're told otherwise, if you're using those guideline charts for your various things. So do you recommend giving tenants useful life items in advance or like when the lease is signed or is it sort of generally applied to deductions after the fact? You can do both. Keep in mind that the judge is the final decider of whether right. that's legal or not. You can do it at the beginning or you can use it as an internal guideline for your own uh, porters or maintenance people that fix the unit up. Right. And so as I explain useful life rule to our clients, I, I use kind of cars as an analogy. If you go out and you get in an accident in your car, your insurance company isn't going to give you the money to buy a new car. They're going to give you what your car is worth today if you happen to total it. So that's kind of the way the useful life rule applies also regarding all property within a home. I mean, your carpet, the blinds, you know, the appliances, pretty much everything in the home. Is that correct? I would agree with that, okay. especially very long-term tenants. You might want to give them the benefit of the doubt on virtually everything unless it's intentional and give them the whole deposit back because if they've been there for 10 years, for example, yeah. you're going to have a tough time you know, deducting for anything. Well, sure. With 10 years, I mean, carpet usually has a useful life of maybe five to eight years, right. something like that. So, yeah. okay. All right. Well, let's touch on the final topic here, and that is eviction. This is your specialty. How frequently do evictions really occur? Are there percentages that you have? Are there any stats in the state of California? Uh, first of all, let me tell you, <laughs> I've been in business for 16 years as yeah. a property manager. We've never had an eviction. So okay. I'm pretty proud Would of that. that <laughs> I'm pretty proud he's, of that. He's baiting it now. Now, so. I'd be remiss okay. not to talk up, uh, talk about it. And Before I would I be- I'm off the Tater trial, I told people- Let's not make a habit of this, okay? Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's good. let's talk about that. There's another term for eviction. That's an unlawful, unlawful detainer, detainer action. That's what the state of California gives an eviction action. We can call it an eviction, unlawful detainer. Basically, it's a lawsuit. It's the only way to evict a person that hasn't paid rent or has done something else in violation of the lease agreement. The notice is just the first step in the process. Once you serve a three-day notice, and by the way, if Non-payment of rent are probably 75% of the eviction sure. in San Diego County. You or know, I guess there could be breach of contract from some other violation. Yeah. So the, the, non, the behavioral ones, uh, I've seen everything. Everything from too many people living there, to unauthorized sure. pets, to drug uses, to harboring fugitives. I mean, it can right. get really ugly. Most of these things I just described don't happen ordinarily, but there are some exceptions. Let's pause for a minute. So in the state of California, I understand there's a five-day grace period on paying rent. Is that right? So rents typically do, oh, you're shaking your head. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's not true. Okay, here, explain here. explain when, because you, you talked about the three-day notice. So well, let's, let's kind of go through, I guess, a chronological order of the steps of eviction, if you had to go there. All right. Sounds like a plan. Rent is due in advance on the first, I assume. Yes. There is a late charge provision in this lease that Bob's describing. Okay. A lease of, uh, say, $100, uh, if not paid by the fifth. I'm afraid that the imposition of the late charge provision does not, in and of itself, create a grace period. Rent is due in advance on the first. It's deemed to be delinquent on the second. So if you want to rush things, you could give a three-day notice to pay rent or quit I see. without the late charge. On the second, subject to the first being on a holiday or weekend, got to give the next business day. So a three-day notice starts the process, but that's just the beginning. If you keep serving notices, that's not going to work. You're going to have to make a decision just to go to court or not. Because in California, you need a court judgment for eviction, need the sheriff to come out and remove them. And in short, the steps are a summons and complaint is filed following expiration of the notice. They're served with that by a processor. A Judgment is entered if they don't reply to the court within that time period allowed by law. And then the sheriff comes out and removes him. If it's uncontested, meaning that the tenant never bothers to reply to the summons by going down to the courthouse to file the reply, then the overall process, unfortunately, in San Diego County these days, could be anywhere from a month to, say, 45 days. Now, these are estimates based on where your property is located. Uncontested. Uncontested. 
for contested. Remember now, filing an answer by the tenant to the eviction paperwork does not mean they win the case, but it does give them a delay in the process. And that delay is up to 20 days. Typically, the trials in downtown San Diego, which, by the way, covers all of San Diego County now, even North County goes to San Diego now on evictions. It adds about 15 to 20 days to the process. So a contested case could be anywhere from 45 days to two months as far as wow. from beginning. Yeah. Now, remember, they could move out at any time during the process. If they do, then they pull in the hand in the keys. It's over, and you can stop things. But if they wait until the sheriff throws them out, that's how long it takes. Okay. Now, if somebody doesn't pay their rent, can I use their security deposit in lieu of their payment to cure the default on rent? And if I do that, then what needs to happen to reinstate the security deposit? Can you do it? Yes. yes. Should you? No, because now you're left bare. Okay. You could do that in a deal with them promising to vacate at the end of the month and the deposit mm-hmm. for the month's rent. You can do that. But there's no law that forces you, even though they give a 30-day notice to get out on month to month, to apply the deposit to last month's rent. That would be your agreement with the tenant to use the deposit for last month's rent. Now, if during the tenancy, you decide to do that, to cut them a break, then you have no deposit on account. Next month's rent will be due and they're still there, but now you have no deposit. So if you say, well, use the deposit this month and two or three months down the road, you change your mind, you want to reinstate the deposit, then you would have to give them a change in terms of tenancy that the deposit is now due in 30 days. Pay it back. Well, you we can give it to you credit before, then serve a three-day notice to cure covenant is what I understand. You'd have to change the terms back because you already gave them a credit for the deposit against the month's rent. And so bad idea. In a <laughs> but you could do that. It's a little quirky, but nothing okay. keeping you from doing it. I just don't recommend it. And what are the typical costs of an eviction? Uh, eviction. I don't know if you're able to give any stats on that or. I'd like to tell you 10 bucks an hour, but that's just, you know. Yeah, that's Remember, uh, yeah. a lot of people think it's all attorney's fees, but it's a combination of court costs and attorney's fees. And the court mm-hmm. costs are about half of it. I mean, for example, the filing fee alone is $240. Process service fees, the sheriff charges is 145 So four or $500 is your court costs all the way through. Uh, with a limited case. Now, these are cases where the amount of controversy is less than 10,000. Filing fees go up in the court and the non commercial cases are residential where that's more. On attorney's fees, it's about $300 or so for uncontested. And it ends up being a little bit more for contested. It depends on who's fighting the case. Is it the tenant representing themselves? That's one issue. Or if they have an attorney, for example, the Legal Aid Society. Representing that never make it a little bit more expensive. So it depends on whether it's contested or uncontested. And my personal philosophy is try to keep the price down because I like long-term relationships with clients. I like to be part of their team on management of their properties. And so, you know, we have this trust and loyal thing to where I don't want to charge too much in any case. And so I try to keep the price down as much as possible. But it's the when the tenant side of the case creates trouble, I have to respond and fight back. And so right. therefore it becomes more expensive. So would you say eight nine hundred dollars, twelve hundred dollars? I mean, what's yeah, kind of it, a, in that range? Yeah, that's a, that's a good okay. range. So because I get asked that all the time, like, okay, how much would it cost, and how long would it take? And I think what we're saying it's in that maybe eight to twelve hundred dollar range, and could take up to two months, mm-hmm. depending upon whether it's contested or uncontested. Don't get me wrong; I'm all in favor of your work in the accounts. The three hundred dollars to serve. You can call them. And say, look, I'm going to have to do this. Keep calling and then oh, try yeah. to get the money. Don't go straight to the unlawful container unless you really want them out quickly. You can file it on day four after the three days. But if you work the account, you minimize your unlawful detainer trips to the courthouse. So once that becomes a matter of what's worse, having to pay attorney's fees to a victim or continuing to lose rent on a daily basis, mm-hmm. you got to cut your losses to stop the bleeding. And so unfortunately, you're left with the unlawful detainer process. Some tenants say, I'm not going to pay you, and I'm going to stay here until I get thrown out because I'm going to be homeless. I got nowhere to go. So yeah. stuff like that forces your hand to file the unlawful detainer because if you don't, they'll just stay there for free forever. Yeah, you can't let that linger and you know continue in that state. Okay, so like I said at the beginning of the episode, <laughs> we could go on for hours and we could spend a whole episode and then some just on eviction. So what else? Is there anything else we should touch on? Any other kind of uh, words of advice for the uh, landlord or the landlord-to-be? Well, just stay educated. 
And remember, most tenants, despite what you've heard in this podcast, are honest, rent-paying people. Rental property is a beautiful investment choice. I'm all in support of it. And I want people to know that, you know, don't think of your legal aspects as a determining factor in decisions. And my wish for your listeners is that 100% of your rents are collected and you never have to serve a three-day notice to pay rent. That's my wish. Of course, it's only a dream. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining the podcast, Ted. This was extremely useful information that I'm sure our listeners can utilize in considering renting their home. And once again, if someone is interested in contacting you for a quote, maybe your phone number or your law office again, where they could Google it or or give you a ring. Sure. Appreciate it. It's 619-542-7728. And the email address again for me is evict at Ted Smith Law. No periods. Info, I-N-F-O. Great. Well, that concludes today's episodes. Thank you for joining the Property Management Brainstorm podcast. Until next time, we will be in the field working hard for our clients to maximize their property value and income and maintain top tenant relations. And we will see you next time.